Well, hi, Demo Turing, Hello. and thank you so much for being here. Um, looking at your career, we could see two parts. First, there's the legal career, of course. Uh, you were a partner and a consultant for the law firm uh, Clifford Chance, and then you specialize in the financial sector. And then, of course, there's the Alan Turing part, as, of course, you are his nephew. And my first question will be, um, how, when did you feel like you had to become his biographer and his spokesperson? Uh, yeah, I think the, f the, f the idea first came to me when there was the centenary year. 2012 was the 100th anniversary of Alan Turing's birth, so there was lots of interest in him uh, at that time. And I started asking myself questions, which had been at the back of my mind yeah, for a long a time a about where his ideas had come from. And I wanted to know the truth about the end of his life and things like that. So um, I started thinking about those things and doing some of my own research. Mm -hmm. And then it just occurred to me that really the existing biographies of Alan Turing did not really approach these subjects in the way that I was understanding them, so I thought it would be uh, interesting for me to write my own account uh, of, of his life. So that's that's how it began. And it got more and more interesting. The more I did research, yeah. the more new stories I, I, I discovered. So yeah, it's, been, so, it's, been a good, so, it's been a good experience. Yeah, I guess so. So what's, what's your purpose when you come to this type of conference and you explain and tell about the life and work of your uncle? This, this conference has been very interesting because this is the first time I've stood up in front of a large audience of people and talked about the present day relevance of Alan Turing's yeah. work on artificial intelligence. Um, and in preparing for this, it's been very interesting to see how we have become stuck, if you like. The way that we think about artificial intelligence is still stuck in the same mindset that we had in the late 1940s when Alan yeah. Turing first came up with the ideas. I think that's very interesting. Artificial intelligence itself has moved on a great deal. I mean, the things that you know intelligent systems can do these days are just unbelievably clever. Of course. But the philosophy of the subject is still very much back in the middle of the previous century. That's very interesting. And yeah, I, I and wanted to challenge the audience to think about that a bit harder. Exactly, and I think you, you talk about the robot fallacy trap. Yes. One mentioning this, um, saying that uh, there's a huge mix up between robots and AI. <laughs> and um, so how can we demystify that? How can we create a dialogue around it? Yes, I think, uh, I think it's very difficult because people, uh, science fiction is great. I mean, I love science fiction movies. Everybody loves science fiction movies, but the problem is that science fiction movies then set the agenda for us when we're talking about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is not something that you can see. It's not a robot that's going to come and, I don't know, um, beat you up or, yeah. you know, it's, it's not going to... Um, artificial intelligence is the kind of thing that helps you when you put your passport into the machine. It can do the facial recognition and see that it's you that Precisely, wants to yeah. come into the country. Mm. Um, so we need to be clear that these are two separate things robots may have artificial intelligence inside them and be learning but uh, I think I'm not concerned about robots I don't think that robots are going to take over the planet and uh, are going to you know, I step out of the building I'm going to be shot by a robot policeman <laughs> I don't think that's a real 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 risk All right. <laughs> but I am I am interested in how machine learning may evolve how it may grow into something that's more intelligent than human beings are mm -hmm. and then then there's a question well what are we going to do when we get to that stage? To what extent can we control somebody that is, or something that is more intelligent than us? And I, I don't know the answers to this, but we should, we should start the discussion. Yeah. So it won't be like with Enigma, when it only it takes a machine to beat a machine. So do you think that could be the same with artificial intelligence? Well, I, you might think that. I mean, f first of all, I wondered whether you might be able to devise some kind of box that you could put your artificial intelligence project inside. Mm. Um, but I don't think that's feasible. And I read a paper very recently which said that taking Alan Turing's ideas from 1936, that they proved that it is not possible to devise an algorithm, a computer yeah. program, to tell whether you will, whether your AI project, your app, is going to be super intelligent or not. It's not 
it's not possible to devise an algorithm to do that. So we can't rely on technology to solve this problem for yeah. us. We have to think about it as human beings. Ourselves, yeah. And what do you think Alan Turing would have think about uh, today's evolution of artificial intelligence? What do you think he would be particularly interested in or cautious about? I, you know, it's really difficult to know because obviously he's been dead for a very long time and uh, things have moved on so much. I think he would probably be quite astonished by what we mm. can now do. But the interesting thing, many people don't know this, that Alan Turing had moved away from work on computers. So at the end of his life, he was, he was, he'd moved into biology. Um, so he might have been interested in neuroscience, but uh, he was looking yeah. at the growth and form of living things that had grown out of his work on on artificial intelligence curiously but uh, and his work on cybernetics but he was very interested in um, how uh, if you for example you take a horse embryo okay an embryo is shaped like a tennis ball All right and he says this is a this is a mathematical problem for us because uh, it has spherical symmetry. It has no top, no bottom, mm -hmm. no front, no back. And yet, uh, he says in his paper, he says, a horse is not a spherically symmetrical object. How can you disrupt that spherical symmetry and turn it into a horse? That's a very complex and interesting question. And he was working on equations, mathematical equations, to turn a sphere into something that looks more like a horse. So he he kind of moved into a completely new sphere, Field, so yeah. uh, it's, it's very difficult to know quite where he might have gone next. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know why he moved to this different field? What really made him want to go further, but not in the computer direction? He could have just gone further with well, the computer. Well, we're going to go back to robots, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. He All joined right. a group called the Ratio Club, um, which was a group of scientists, there were some biologists and there were some computer scientists mm -hmm. and, and various other folks who were in this, in this group. And they were looking at the problem that we now call cybernetics, which is essentially about how robots can work out yeah. whether they're about to walk yeah, into the walk wall. In it, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and he was coming at this very much from the sort of computer science angle, but he started thinking that these problems of control and development are in a, in a sense, they're biological problems. And so he started thinking about growth and development in, in organisms. But there was another thing, and I, I was asking myself this same question that you asked mm -hmm. me when I was doing the research. And I suddenly realized that the answer to the question had been staring me in the face because his professor in his uh, computer laboratory was Max Newman, and his mathematical specialism was topology. It was about shapes. Oh, right, yeah. And so, so he'd been sitting there for five mm. years talking to this guy. In fact, he'd known Max Newman since 1936, so he'd known him for nearly 20 years. And they'd been talking about topology for 20 years. <laughs> and I thought, you don't need to ask yourself, uh, it's not a difficult question. Where did I, why did Alan Turing start working on shapes? It's kind of because he was talking about it every day. Yeah, <laughs> <So> <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, so uh, I thought, uh, okay, sometimes I realize I'm a bit stupid. <laughs> And did he have any thoughts on ethics when he built uh, the machine that broke Enigma? Did he, did he think that he had built something so powerful that we would need to think about it in the future? I think not at that stage, um, because uh, it was, uh, if you like, an existential crisis for uh, Britain, just as it was for France in 1940. Mm -hmm. There was this existential problem that uh, it was either us or them. Yes. So I think the ethical questions became much simpler in, the, in those days. Of course. But he, before the war, he was, when he was studying in America, he started getting interested in codes and ciphers. And he, uh, he wrote a letter where he said, I think I've invented a new really clever form of cipher. We, we don't know what this was. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but he says, I could sell it to the UK government, but I'm not sure about the ethics of that. So that's uh, <laughs> so it did cross his mind. So, so yes. he was certainly there. The ethical things were in in his mind. And just to talk um, one last time about Enigma, um, it took place like breaking the code. Took place in a really dire situation, like you said. The Allies were pretty much losing the war. Uh, do you do you think we need to be in dire situations or crisis to to see such scientific leaps occur? 
That's a very, a very interesting question and one where I have listened to discussions on this and there are some people who will say very loudly that we have amazing scientific breakthroughs every five minutes and we're in the middle of a big uh, wave of scientific developments and there are other people who say we have not done anything significant in science or mathematics mm. for a hundred years. We have not had a theory of evolution, a theory of relativity, yes. Alan Turing's paper on computable numbers. We have not had anything like that for over a hundred years. So uh, uh, all I can do is say I'm not a scientist, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what would you think anyway? Well, I, I have to say I'm constantly amazed at technology developments. I'm not sure about scientific theory, but technology developments are amazing. If you just look back 20 years ago when you know, we didn't have mobile phones and we had, if you were lucky, you had a fax machine. And, mm. uh, you know, you think about how just things have transformed the way that we uh, operate our lives. Yeah. We didn't have internet shopping, you know. I mean, how would we, it's really difficult to imagine how, how you actually found your way from Paris to Bordeaux without Google Maps. You know, how would you do that? I mean, how would you do that? <laughs> and we did it somehow. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> so have we grew dumb? Yeah. <laughs> have we grew yeah. dumb with technology yeah. or yes. lazier? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, we've become much more dependent on things. And that provides new sources of threats to us for mm. the future, I guess. So people thinking about that. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. That's all for my questions. Thank all you right. so much. It's been a pleasure.